Now, U.S. lawmakers are going after China as a currency manipulator. Again, this tends to be kind of popular in Washington. So is this legitimate or is this just China bashing for political reasons? And also, as more people worry about a global economy risking lapsing into recession, what's going to be the tipping point and is there any stopping it? To help me make sense of all of these big economic issues going on right now is legendary investor and author Jim Rogers. Hi, Jim. Thanks so much for being on the show. Hello, Laura. Nice to see you. All the way from Singapore, uh, early yep. in the morning for you. So yep. Yep. tonight here in Washington, uh, a bill actually cleared a hurdle in the Senate that would impose tariffs on Chinese imports and uh, penalize China as a currency manipulator. Now, bashing China as a currency manipulator tends to be pretty popular in Washington, especially with unemployment stuck at 9%. So is that what we're seeing, or is this legitimate? Lauren, first of all, they're doing this so that the media will cover it. It's the media charade, and you're covering it, as will everybody else. Uh, as you, if you read the bill, you see that there's an out. They leave it up to the Department of the Treasury to determine what to do. But, Lauren, this could be terribly, terribly dangerous if we turn into a trade war. We had a trade war in the 1930s. It led to the Great Depression. We already have small signs of trade wars breaking out. Brazil, France, other places, now America. This could be very dangerous in the end. His government here has now hit back on this matter, saying it resolutely opposes the U.S. Senate advancing the debate on this controversial currency bill. China's foreign ministry says the U.S. is simply using currency imbalance as an excuse to try and adopt protectionist trade measures. Yin Hang has the details on that story. In a statement released, China's foreign ministry spokesman Ma Zhaoxu says China resolutely opposes the U.S. Senate's move in passing the Currency Exchange Rate Oversight Reform Act 2011. The statement says the bill is using currency imbalance to heighten the currency issue between the two countries. It also makes the argument that the bill violates WTO rules and poses a serious threat to the trade relationship between the two countries. The spokesman is urging the U.S. not to politicize economic and trade issues. He also says the exchange rate of the renminbi is not the root cause of the trade imbalance between China and the U.S. The People's Bank of China says it deeply regrets the currency bill and goes as far as to say it could affect the country's currency reform and lead to a potential trade war. In a written response to media questions, China's central bankers say that Sino-U.S. trade imbalance has many root causes, differences in investment structure, saving and consumption ratios, and the vastly different roles played in the global supply chain by the two countries. The central bank says China will continue to advance currency reform measures in a controlled and gradual process. It says the bill is unlikely to help the U.S. shrug off its saving deficiency, trade deficit, and high unemployment. Figures provided by China's Ministry of Commerce show that China's currency exchange rate is now in tandem with the country's trade structure, with the country's trade surplus accounting for less than 1.5% of the country's GDP. In the meantime, U.S. exports to China have surged around 380% from 2001 to the end of 2010 to reach around 92 billion U.S. dollars. The yuan has appreciated by more than 7% since June last year, when China began another round of currency reform. Okay, Jim, I want to get back to this serious stuff, but are, are you saying that basically I'm a sucker? No, no, I'm not saying you're a sucker. <laughs> 535 people in Congress who paid a lot of money and have huge staffs uh, pull this off. They do this and they give it to you. No, it's, of course it's serious. Lauren, if it turns into a trade war, it is the most momentous thing of 2011. Trade wars lead, always lead to wars. Nobody wins trade wars, except, you know, generals wind up fighting the physical wars when this happens. No, no, this is very dangerous. So, no, you're right to cover it. The problem is Congress is making them make themselves look good when, in fact, they may be having a problem. Now, to China, and are they manipulating? China certainly has set its, its currency at an artificial rate, but to their defense, they have been opening it up for six years now. Nearly every quarter they do more and more to make the currency more internationally tradable and it does find its own level. Would I do it the way China is doing it? No, I would do it this afternoon. I would do it right now. I'd make the currency completely free-floating. 
Mm -hmm. I'm not China. They don't listen to me. They don't listen to anybody. Candidly, there were some profiles in Courage uh, from senators on both sides of the aisle that have tough races back home. But I hope by the time we have the cloture vote to end debate, there'll be at least 41 people that will agree that starting a trade war right now with China is not very intelligent. And again, the way we need to get our economy growing is to address our own long-term issues. No short-term stimulus. There's nothing short-term that's going to affect our economy. We need, as a country, to go ahead and have the courage to deal with the longer-term issues. That is the best short-term stimulus we need that we can have, and we need to embrace China. The fact is that our exports there are growing. We've got three free trade agreements coming to the floor finally after almost 900 days. And on the other hand, we're talking about doing something to damage trade relations with the fastest growing, largest other economy in the world. It just not, it's not sensible. And the fact that the White House does not want to weigh in because they don't want to offend their friends at the AFL-CIO and other places, to me, is just not mature. So, look, uh, I, I'm not happy about this. I think this is taking our eye off what we ought to be focused on right now, and certainly very damaging, in my opinion, if it were actually to become law to our country. By the way, a lot of people think that this gives the president the ability to waive off tariffs on issues that relate to the currency. It does not. The tariffs have to go in place under this legislation. Again, poorly drafted, not well thought out, plays great back home and really, you know, appeases people back home that are upset, but it's the wrong way to do it. I, you know, the White House is in a tough spot. I, 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 figure, I figure you'd at least give them kudos for finally getting those trade bills said. They're going to take flack from Trump and the AFL-CIO on these trade bills. They're taking it right now. Yeah, well, look, I, I actually, I heard the Commerce Secretary, or Acting Commerce Secretary, I thank her for her input on the three trade bills. I, I thought it was very, she very good. Said on the other hand, she, she was incredible. The White House is working to, to look at, yeah. it, at this bill in the Senate to see if it does anything yeah. that, that's positive. She didn't endorse it, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, it's the most mealy-mouthed answer ever. Look, uh, you know, the White House needs to go ahead, the Treasury Secretary and others, Go ahead and tell us how damaging, tell people on their side of the aisle how damaging this bill would be to our country. The fact is, when you have tariffs kick in, everything slows. So, so, so look, I mean, we all know this is, they need to go ahead and do the things that leaders in the White House have to do, and that is take tough positions that further this country's interest. They're not doing that. Hopefully, by the time we have this vote at the end of the week, they will do that so at least a few more Democrats will oppose this bill, and hopefully more Republicans after this debate ends and we don't have the appropriate amount of amendments to really change the character of this bill, hopefully this bill will go down. I'm afraid if it passes, there will be pressure in the House to do the same thing, and then you end up with a piece of legislation, again, that, you know, it really appeals to the nativist interest, if you will, in this country, but it, it's obviously terrible public policy. I think everybody knows that, and look, we need to continue to work with these folks to liberalize their financial system. It's already beginning to occur. As the middle class grows there, they're going to want U.S. products. We need to develop trade relationships with China. We don't need to, to, to cause that to dissipate. I know that. I mean, their currency has risen, I think, what, 30 percent since 2005. So my question for you, you're talking about a trade war. What would happen in order for that to happen? Well, if America does put on tariffs onto the Chinese, the Chinese have various uh, weapons at their disposal. They could stop buying American government bonds. They could sell American government bonds. If they did that, interest rates in America would go through the roof. The value of the U.S. dollar would go down a lot, perhaps a lot or at least a little. Now, this would not be good for anybody, including for China. But, but what happens, Laura, whenever people get slapped in the face, they always think they have to slap back. Yeah, well, along with what you're saying with the U.S. dollar, that's something that people have been saying for a while, that the U.S. dollar is going to be hit with all of this bad economic news and in any number of scenarios, but that hasn't happened. Why is that? Well, to full disclosure, I own the U.S. dollar. I've talked on your network before that I own the U.S. dollar. One reason it hasn't is because, first of all, there were so many people who sold the dollar that all of a sudden people find themselves too short the dollars, and they got to bring some of them back in. 
Second, there's chaos in the rest of the world too, and many people, wrongly in my view, wrongly, flee to the U.S. dollar as a safe haven. I own it. I don't own it as a safe haven. I own it because I just assume everybody else is going to run there. It could go much higher for a while. So you own it because you think everybody else is dumb. <laughs> I don't know that they're dumb. That's your word. You're a good reporter, I'm sure. Uh, I own it because I know that the standard reaction is, in times of confusion, to run to the U.S. dollar. It is the wrong thing to do, in my view, but I know they're all going to do it, so I've, I've done it. Well, I originally did it, Lauren, as I told you all before, was because everybody was so pessimistic on the dollar, and I have found in my career that when everybody is on one side of the boat, Lauren, you should go to the other side for a while. So I bought U.S. dollars because of the pessimism. All right, because of the pessimism. There's still a lot of pessimism right now, and a lot of it has to do with debt. You're always very uh, harsh on the U.S. because of U.S. debt. And Bill Gross of PIMCO today was saying that uh, essentially sovereign balance sheets resemble an overweight diabetic on the verge of a heart attack. If you agree with that, what is going to be the heart attack that tips the global economy into recession? Well, I certainly hope you agree with it too, Lauren, because the facts show that there's a very, very serious problem. The U.S. is the worst. We're the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. But many European nations have the problem. The world has run up huge, huge debts in the past 40 or 50 years. We're going to have to pay the piper, and we're paying them now. Bill happens to be exactly right. The world's got some serious, serious problems facing it. And I don't know how it's got, I know how it should be resolved, but I'm afraid it's not going to be resolved without more pain and more suffering. I have sold short stocks in the U.S. and in Europe and at emerging markets. So whichever one goes first, I hope I will save myself. Do you think it would be Europe or the U.S.? Well, it's, it's, it's more likely to be in Europe just because they're right there with a lot of attention on them right now. But as I said before, the U.S. is in worse shape. The U.S. as a whole is the largest debtor nation in history, and we have a lot of independent states, Illinois, California, New York, uh, to name a few, which are in very dire straits, just like Greece and Portugal and Ireland. So all of us, all of us in the West have serious problems. Serious problems uh, and serious gridlock in Washington. And one interesting solution that the former uh, budget director, Peter Orzog, came out with was saying that, hey, maybe America needs less democracy. Maybe more of these decisions need to be made by commissions as opposed to the political institutions that have been mired in gridlock. Does he have a point? I don't know why he thinks that government by committee is going to be any, any better than, than government by Congress. No, committees never work. I mean, if, you, if you're going to take it to the extreme, what you need is a man on a white horse who will come in and say, okay, enough of this mess and start over. I'm not advocating that. I'm not advocating that at all. I'm just suggesting you that it has happened throughout history when things get really bad. But I don't see that a committee, we, we've appointed a committee, Lord. They appointed a, a committee of six politicians. Now, when I say that, I laugh because six politicians are not going to be any better than 535 politicians. Mm -hmm. but, would, but when it comes to economic decisions, might it be better if America had a little less democracy? I know that's not popular to say, but a lot of people said that during the financial crisis that China did better because it could just make more decisions without this political process. Well, you always have the danger, Lord, that they make the wrong decisions. It so happened that China made the right, mainly made the right decisions in the past 30 years. Singapore, where I live, has made brilliant decisions for 40 years. But suppose you have guys making the wrong decisions. Then it's disaster. Then it's North Korea. Then it's Cuba. I, I don't want to live in Cuba. I don't want to live in North Korea, where the decisions have been even worse. You need an enlightened, someone in, with enlightenment who can see the problems and do it. Unfortunately, we don't have many of those people in Washington, D.C. anymore. So you're saying that you would not trust anybody in the U.S. to make the right decisions? I don't trust many politicians anywhere, Lauren. If I haven't made myself clear, let me say again, a pox on all of their houses. Very, most politicians are more worried about the next election than anything else. Lauren, the studies show that the good politicians, at least in the U.S., were people who were very good at playground when they were in school. Well, that's who we now have running things. They're good at playground, but they're not good at figuring out how to solve real problems.